Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Deviant Mind. This is Dominica. And I'm Christopher. And sorry that we missed putting out this episode at the uh, at the beginning of this week, but I unfortunately had to uh, let go of my wonderful, amazing dog, Marlo Bubby Best. Um, he's now uh, running in the stars, so it's been a very difficult week for me, but um, yeah. hopefully this is coming out on Friday, March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Yes. Um, as well. And we today are doing the Sarah Lawrence... I guess I don't want to call it a sex cult, but it's a cult. Right. Um, and Larry Ray was the leader of said cult. Yeah. And I'm thinking this is going to be a two or maybe even three parter. So we're going to go over kind of what happened and uh, some cult behaviors, uh, some definitions. So as we go through the story, that you can identify exactly how these kids came under the thrall of this man. And then next week, we're going to go over who exactly this freak show was, because he's definitely, yeah. oh boy. <laughs> yeah. so. Incidentally, uh, Dominica and I were going to try, uh, because it's St. Patrick's Day, find uh, a case, in, a murder case involving a shillelagh or a pot of gold. <laughs> but th but there are just no cases like that exist. So we decided or maybe, to do it. Yes, exactly. And maybe we missed some. So if you have some, please uh, go into our Instagram and let us know. And uh, we might be a little late, but we'll do one. Um, so Where do we begin? Actually, I know, right? Um, so I'm going to start. So there was an article that came out uh, with, it was incredible journalism from Ezra Marcus and James D. Walsh at the cut of New York Magazine that published this article, The Stolen Kids of Sarah Lawrence. And this was in April of 2019. And this really started this entire investigation. Uh, by the way, Larry Ray was just sentenced this year, January 20th, 2023, to 60 years in prison mm -hmm. for what he did to these kids. Uh, but this article was the first thing that really put this out um, into the world. And also the bravery of the victims that came forward to talk to these journalists about what had happened to them. Because the story goes from 2010, September, yeah. all the way to 2000, I think, 18. So it was a decade of some of these kids being under this. I mean, he really is just a freak show. <laughs> like it was. Uh, I, incidentally, uh, one of the reporters of this article, uh, was he a Sarah Lawrence alum? I'm not sure, actually. Um, I know there I'm, was some investigative reporter that was also, uh, you know, uh, you know, writing, writing, and you know, investigating the whole situation. Yeah. But I believe he was also an alum and kind of saw or knew the people involved. I knew the people. Okay, so maybe that's that. That's he what it was. One, but I think he's one of the New York Magazine writers, but I'm not too sure. Okay. Well, we will definitely uh, put that in the show notes and let you know which one he was. But this. Again, this is why we need journalists, people like these yeah. people broke this story and uh, really got this guy to go to jail to protect uh, us from him because, oh my yeah. gosh. Um, so as I said, uh, he was this man, Larry Ray, was the father of Talia Ray, who was a student at Sarah Lawrence, and he was the leader of the cult of this de facto cult. But it was as we were speaking before we started uh, recording, this was a cult of like five, six kids. So we're not talking yeah. like the NXIV cult or anything like that. It was very small, but as yeah. we'll go over, it had all of the, um, the indoctrination, um, the shame, but we will go over that in a second. Uh, yeah. So... How did this begin? How did Larry Ray get access to Sarah Lawrence students? And how did these kids get involved with an ex-con on an elite college campus? Because this all began at Sarah Lawrence in a dorm room. Yeah. And it was because of Talia Ray, his daughter, who I know some people have tried to demonize her because she was essentially the recruiter. But at the same time, it almost seems like she was one of his first, well, not one of his first victims, 
But within this story, she was one of his victims because she had been indoctrinated by him since she was a young kid. Seven years she old. She was turned seven years old. Seven she years was old. turned against her mother. They, yeah, they uh, they get divorced. It's a really nasty divorce. And at one point, he just takes her. They actually kind of yep. flee. And um, when they ran off, when they ran off, he eventually goes to jail for what they, you know, kidnapping and basically taking yeah. her. Yeah, exactly. So she ends up at Sarah Lawrence. She's a little older than everybody else. So she kind of becomes like the de facto leader of her uh, friends because uh, they're all, you know, they're all freshmen. They're like 18, 19 years old. Yeah. And she had always talked about her dad uh, to everybody that knew her, that she called him a truth teller mm -hmm. and that he was in prison because powerful people were after him and he tried to save her and her sister from their mother and again we'll go into him next week because this yeah. guy is a full-on trip but she truly and believed scarily, she truly believed that he was locked up for political reasons like that everyone, is correct everyone was his enemy yeah like and we go like this guy again he there's he has some connections to some crazy people so 100%. again we'll go into that in the next episode so stay tuned to that but, but back that's to another Sarah Lawrence. She's a victim is because she was so manipulated and enthralled with him. And I'm sure during the divorce, you know, that was part of the grooming process, maybe even a little before. Yeah. But she's completely a victim to the point where she believes her dad's a god. You know, he can do no yeah. wrong. Yeah, absolutely. He can absolutely do no wrong. So when he got out of prison... So first of all, she organized on-campus housing for her group of friends in Sloanham Woods 9, which was a brick dorm in the middle of campus. Yeah. There was seven total roommates that lived there. And pretty much at the beginning of their sophomore year, she announced that her father, who was just getting out of prison, was coming to stay. Which, <laughs> uh, hello, Sarah Lawrence, what the hell are you doing? So... <laughs> she I, and I believe he's 53 at the time, either between 50 that is and correct. 56 years old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 53, 56 years old, ex con. Yeah. And he's going to now, when the parents of some of the other students complained about what this man was doing sleeping in the dorm room of these six kids on campus, this is on campus housing, by the way. Yeah. This is not like off campus, this is on sanctioned on campus housing. They were like, well, but he's the father of one of the students. What can we do? He's living there. Like, what? Anyway, yeah. so he moves in. He's, st uh, he's sleeping in the common room. Yeah. And he immediately starts love bombing. He's cooking everybody's steak dinners. Yep. He's getting expensive takeout. And he's regaling all of these students around him about stories of him being a government agent, an international CIA operative. I'm not even joking how he engineered a ceasefire in Kosovo, mm -hmm. he talks about how he was in the Marine Corps and how he knew all of these big, high-ranking American officials. And so these kids, because remember, these are 18 and 19-year-olds are like, yeah. wow, this guy is amazing. Now, mind you, he's bald and overweight and, again, an ex-con. <laughs> uh, well, I think say. also what's amazing is we got to give Talia credit for you know, telling her housemates, my dad is going to stay for a while. He just got out of prison. Mm -hmm. She turns it into like an inch, like they can't say no. And at first they're hesitant, but then they kind of warm up to it. You know, he's cooking for us. You know, he's kind of cool. And like, she loves him and yeah. we love her. So, but I find that really yeah. interesting that, it, you know, if, if you're living with a few people in a dorm room and someone says, hey, my dad just got out of prison. He's going to stay for a bit. It kind of stops there. Like, I don't want to know how great he is, but it's Just, I, no. I feel she has the same. <laughs> so she learned her powers of manipulation from her pop because that's pretty manipulative. Yeah. Like, hey, my dad's going to, yeah. you know, she, you know, he's yeah, kind of against exactly. the of the housemates. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, these housemates were, you know, very typical, smart, introverted kids yeah. with good grades. Sarah Lawrence is like a very well-respected, uh, small liberal arts college just right outside of New York City. Yeah. And again, these are young kids. They're at this point, 19 years old. And, you know, he's kind of a very good listener. He took on the dad role in the dorm. 
and some of these kids were troubled. So before I get into this, I want to go into um, indoctrination theory Mm -hmm. and authoritarian control, because I think that plays such a big part of it. And so if I give you kind of a basic overview of what that is, then as we are telling you the story, I'm sure you're going to be like, oh, that's this, that's this, because this is how I came into the story, which I was like, how did this guy do this to these kids? Yeah. And when I found out this authoritarian, I'm probably not even pronouncing that correctly, authoritarian control model, which is called the BITE, B-I-T-E model, then it kind of made a lot of sense. And this model was derived from the work of psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, MD, Louis Jolien West, MD, and psychologists Edgar Sheen, PhD, and Margaret Singer, PhD. Then they were all involved in researching communist brainwashing hmm. that was happening in Maoist China as well in uh, Russia. And the BITE model is an acronym, and it's... Um, it stands for B stands for behavior, I for information, T for thought, and E for emotional control. So now for behavior, typically the leader, the person uh, starts regulating the follower's physical actions by dictating how they associate or are isolated from people. They also take over private decisions like sexual expression, dressing style, what you eat, what you do. Um, So, you know, kind of really controlling actions of people because now they are going to be requiring permission for important decisions. Mm -hmm. Then also there is a punishing for disobedience and it totally discourages individualism and it's all about conformity and group think. Now, the I is information, which is, again, kind of controlling information or withholding information within the group. It also, of course, creates an us against them environment. So it encourages spying with against other members and then reporting people who are maybe are starting to get out yeah. of the cult. And then, of course, there is consuming a lot of the information, which is what we're going to go into because uh, Larry Ray had a very specific worldview that he started mm-hmm. teaching these kids and propaganda. And then this other one that definitely comes into play is using confession. Mm-hmm to shame or mm-hmm. blackmail and then withholding absolution from said confession yeah. um, to shame and blackmail. So T is for thought control. And so that typically stands for um, eliminating critical thinking, instilling black and white thinking, creating false memories, which is something that we're yeah. going to get into. And then also using stopping tricks to eliminate negative thoughts about the person, which would be like meditating praying, uh, justification, Mm -hmm. denial. And then the E is emotional Mm -hmm. control. So we have the fraction nation, which is combining love bombing with breaking rapport. And this is a technique that is very typically used Mm -hmm. with narcissists. So it creates a need that then doesn't get fulfilled until the person complies. So it really puts you under their control. Uh, also the, um, the leader promotes feelings of insecurity mm-hmm. and guilt. And then there's issues of identity and a guilt over things that they had done. And then it promotes fear of having the group's disapproval if you do something wrong. And he promotes phobias, um, which again, we're going to get mm-hmm. into. So as we're telling you the story, kind of you're going to hear like, oh, wait a minute that was mm-hmm. E or that was T because it's, it's just very, very specific. Yeah. And he, by the way, has already started that because he started with the love bombing. So he's now the group dad. Yeah. He has given them steak dinners. He's getting them expensive takeout. He's having movie nights with them. So he's yeah. kind of bringing him, them all under his yeah. tent and then being like, look how amazing I am and look how amazing you are. I am just going to give you so much. And as before I went into the bite model, as I was saying, these kids were typical introverted, but they also did have some issues sure. going on, like all people do. Um, so Daniel Barbin Levin was one of the roommates and he was in the midst of questioning his sexuality, even though he had yeah. a girlfriend. There was Isabella Pollock, who at the time of her meeting 
Larry. She was Talia's, Talia Ray's yeah. best friend. And she had gone through a really bad breakup uh, right as, as he kind of arrived at the dorm and was really mm-hmm. unmoored. There was also Claudia, who was struggling with depression, and Santos, who had dated Talia, and he was also struggling with depression. And his parents had said in this article that he had actually tried to commit suicide and in high Ola school. And as his sisters get roped so, into it as well. Uh, yes, exactly. And his older sisters get roped into this. And, uh, and also, it's interesting to know, you so, know he apparently, uh, Ray did study cults. Which makes sense because you know, again, you start he, off. He you start off as a nice guy. Here's pizza. I'll do the dishes. Hi guys, let's sit down and play music. But uh, sit, but at, at night he would sit down individually to express this notion of uh, everyone's quest for uh, potential. That everyone has the capabilities of getting yes. over their insecurities. They can get over uh, the feeling of alienation by just opening up and they should start with him because they could trust him. Right. Which again is a lot of self-help that actually is true. It's just, you have to be very careful of who you're going right. to open up to and an ex con, a uh, 53 ex con who moves into your dorm room is probably not yeah. going to be the guy. Um, and so then I also wonder like, did Talia Ray kind of like, again, through her manipulation because she was so damaged mm-hmm. by her father get these like a very group of kids that were very susceptible mm-hmm. anyway yeah and so um he you know he made very big claims he claimed that he could help cure depression and he knew techniques to help control the mind and he said that uh you know the marines had taught him so much about control and how to be physically strong and again, we're going to find out that that's all a bunch of bullshit, but that's next week. <laughs> so he first started with Isabella. And Isabella, as we said, was Talia Ray's best friend. And she was from San Antonio, Texas. And she was on a full scholarship to Sarah Lawrence from an all girls Catholic high school. She was having a really hard time. She had lost a lot of confidence after her breakup with her boyfriend. And in this article, some of the students in that dorm said that she she was really fragile. Like she she was going she through a, a lot. Childhood, from what I understand, and as well. Like it definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she so he picked her. He picked her off. She was the weakest. And so Isabella's ex boyfriend was actually quoted in this original cut article saying that he had seen Larry reclining with Isabella in on her bed. And stroking her hair and saying, no one's going to mess with my baby girl. And was already kind of, he said that he was really uncomfortable about that. And then he found out that Larry had said, hey, I'm going to start sleeping in Isabella's room yeah. from now on. And when somebody's like, what are you talking about? He's like, I'm not sleeping in her bed. I'm going to be sleeping yeah. on the floor because she needs yeah, so she much needs help. Yeah, she needs a lot of help. And uh, not uh, yeah, to, not to jump help. ahead, uh, but since you mentioned his recent conviction uh, and sentencing. Isabella as well uh, just recently received four years for her involvement. And that is correct. She refused yes. to break ties with Larry during the whole thing against her defense team, to, just saying like, look, you were a victim. Parents, she said, no, I'm not. Like I was completely in yeah. control of what I was doing. So just to throw that out there, she was also. Yeah. And, and yeah, and she was still yeah. on it, exactly. And so he started doing like weekly therapy yeah. sessions with her and within three or four months, which is December. So this was all happening through that uh, fall semester. Larry called Isabella's mother and told her that Isabella was not coming home for winter break, that she had also been sexually abused as a child by a family friend. So remember what I said, false memories, implanting yeah. false memories uh, as part of control. Uh, and that if she came home for break, she yeah. would commit suicide. So she was not going to come home for winter break. And Isabella's mother was like, oh, my God, what are you talking about? She had been very close to Isabella and knew that she was having a lot of problems. But she was like, she would yeah. have told me like we were very close. And he was like, no, she's she's just not going to come. Yeah. So uh, that winter break. 
Larry, Talia, Talia's boyfriend at the time, who is not named in this article, and Isabella moved into a one-bedroom condo on East 93rd Street owned mm-hmm. by Lee Chen, who is an old friend of Larry's. And this is where East 93rd Street is where all the damage really takes place. And again, Sarah Lawrence College is just yeah. right outside of New York. So it's um, it, it's it's on the outskirts. And so Daniel, who was the first person who actually came up to these reporters to tell them the story, said, you know, at the time, it was kind of hard to find housing Mm -hmm. in New York City. So the reason why he moved in was like, well, I got kind of into this, but then I didn't have a place to live for the summer. And he kind of like... And he truly believed believed that Ray was helping him, is the other thing. Uh, Yes, 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 yeah, he was, did. Oh, um, we start to see the then, beginnings of separating victims from their families. We yep. no longer need them. Exactly. And then separating from students. So they're isolating them from the students yeah. now as well. So he's gotten to them isolated, yeah. no location. Um, now they're in New York City. They don't have any friends. They're staying at his friend's yeah. apartment. So there's also like they're for staying free. for free. He's yeah. paying for everything. So now they are. Um, you know, uh, what is that word? Um, now they right. owe him something, he's got right? Because right um, he's letting them, st- yeah, he's he's letting them stay. And this is where everything starts spinning out of control. So he started controlling everything that everyone in the condo was doing. So again, yeah. this is, that's the he's first step. Music of the in the morning. Um, that's how we start the day. Blasting music. Yeah. That you have to like, uh, the food was done at a certain time. There was like a certain schedule that everybody had to follow. He was still also love bombing them with lots of fancy dinners and um, he would take them out. There was always a limo waiting for them to take them back, uh, back home. He, uh, so essentially the sleeping uh, accommodations was that Talia and her boyfriend were sleeping in the living room while Larry and Isabella yeah. shared the bedroom. So very obviously Larry, who is by the way, 53 or 53 years mm-hmm. old at this time, bald and overweight is sleeping with the 19 year old. Yeah. Isabella, who is the best friend of his daughter. Uh, I think one of my favorite okay. moments was when uh, Lee Chen, whose apartment this is, comes home. You know, he was always on the road. Mm-hmm. He comes back randomly and he finds Ray, Ty, and Isabella in his bedroom bed and it freaked him out. He said it completely freaked him out. Uh, and he like ran out or something like this and was just like, what, what's going on? What is going on? Like, what? what is this hell? Um, so as we said before, he controlled what they ate when they went to sleep. And also Talia's boyfriend, uh, at the time was taking antipsychotic mm-hmm. medication. And he was like, you should, you should stop that. You don't need that. Uh, Talia's boyfriend was so freaked out over the whole thing that he broke up with her. And, uh, this yeah. was the beginning. So, uh, you know, Talia obviously was already fully indoctrinated. I mean, she yeah. just thinks through this whole thing, she has always stood by her father. She never broke against him, even when he was convicted. And then, you know, again, Isabella is such a heartbreaking victim in in this whole thing. So she's full in. So after this winter break, they all went back to the dorm and Larry started hardcore on the indoctrination of his Mm -hmm. philosophies. Uh, He started making family dinners, quote unquote, mandatory, as well Mm -hmm. as house meetings. And he began preaching this philosophy uh, called Q4P, (laughs) which was based on the supposition that all energy in the universe is powered by the quest for potential. And this Q4P was the brainchild of his friend, David Birnbaum, who is a diamond district dealer who moonlit as a (laughs) philosopher. Again. um, So it's interesting because he takes things that are kind of true and then like puts his own kind of flavor and spin and manipulation into it. Uh, But again, this is the beginning of the brainwashing. Um, He's also making mandatory family dinners, house meetings. There's shame involved if, like, you don't show up for it. These are 19-year-old kids, so they do. Now, this is around the time that um, 
parents started calling and being like, why is this guy living in, this, yeah. in these dorms? And in the original article, uh, Sarah Lawrence refused to yeah. put a statement out and said, well, it was, it was apparent, which again, I, I put a lot of blame on Sarah. Lawrence. They could have gotten lawyers to it's get that guy out of there. I, I don't understand it's why they did it. At a completely Especially unacceptable. School, I mean, so the school has so, been around since 1926. Interesting to note that it became a, <laughs> a co-education in 1968. Uh, so it's like, mm. you know, all this reputation, maybe they felt, you know, we don't address it. We keep getting funds and funding and we get more students. They, it's, this is so small. It's only like a few students who cares, right? And he is the father. We can't expect right. anything. I guess it was also because like there wasn't – I mean, other than, hey, it's really annoying. This is really weird. There was no evidence that he guessed he was doing anything completely, uh, perhaps out of the ordinary, in terms of the school's view, at least, to warrant kicking him out. You know? Like, well, outside of the fact that he's not well, paying I, I, for it. it I, I mean, mean I'm, like... I'm just trying to <laughs> figure out where Sarah, Sarah Lawrence would be coming from and not addressing this. Like, it's just really a school with this right. uh, sort of, you know, stature, like, reputation Why? yeah right exactly and so his next mark yeah. was claudia she uh found the philosophy interesting and she also started having weekly counseling sessions with larry she grew up outside of los angeles and was a real creative storyteller she exaggerated a lot and liked being a center of attention because again she's a 19 yeah. year old girl this is totally normal and i mean just from everything i read she sound really really creative yeah. and bright and she started counseling sessions and so of course when those started she changed a lot she started posting on facebook a lot of yeah. things about the marines she also claimed to people around her that larry had diagnosed yeah. her with schizophrenia larry was in no way shape or form a metal medical doctor in any way and uh, she really started changing for the worse. And this was around the time that Daniel, the other roommate, you know, he found it a little sketchy. And Claudia was definitely mm -hmm. struggling through things. And, you know, I remember being in college my sophomore year. You're just, it's such a huge upheaval. Like, as you, we were talking about, your brain right. hasn't fully formed. So the decision making isn't great. You're you may switch on your, your own, like far you're outside. I mean, Claudia is from Los Angeles. Are. You know? Yeah, it's it's a huge time. So having this extremely toxic, dangerous, evil force within your orbit is just. But when you're a good I manipulator, mean, honestly, uh, yeah. or a great con man, it works with that. It work. It can work on anyone, especially if you're vulnerable. Yeah. And you know he would keep these guys up all night. You know it's not you know Claudia would have a session. Yeah, which is then sleep deprivation. But it'd be like a ten-hour session. These kids got very little sleep. Yeah. In this place. Right. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so he, uh, he really kind of urged Claudia to see a real therapist and she refused. And she said, you know what, Larry is just helping me so much. And when Daniel started having problems with his girlfriend, he didn't know what to do. Santos, who was the other roommate and Claudia were like, you have to go talk to Larry, he will help mm -hmm. you so much. And so Daniel, you know, being 19 and confused and lost we're like okay i'll go talk to larry because he's right there living in this dorm room yeah. that he's not supposed to be at so he went and you know he actually was like oh larry's advice was so straightforward and simple which was dump your girlfriend and know you are not yeah. gay and daniel really appreciated his masculine approach and kind of again fell into having weekly therapy sessions with him too. And I think that's a very good point. If you're having these weekly or daily meetings and dinner meetings that are mm -hmm. keeping you up all night, you're at school doing a lot of work, yeah. you're sleep deprived, you're being manipulated all the time. You just like, it's like butter sliding right in under his control. And so he, again, was also invited to live at East 93rd Street mm -hmm. for the summer uh, with the other Sarah Lawrence kids. And Daniel went on record saying that, you know, at the time it was housing in New York and Larry was helping him. Right. So he agreed to stay there for the but summer. I gotta say, of, of everyone so that was there, 
uh, I think it's safe to say, while everyone obviously was having uh, emotional and mental abuse, he probably received the most physical abuse of of the mm-hmm. folks that were uh, all living together in that well, except for Santos, because there was like, wasn't Santos the was one with the like he was scrotum garrote? You know, he was. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get to we'll that. Get to that. It's, it's, <laughs> we'll get to that. So, um, so, uh, so the for the summer at East Ninety Third Street, there was Dania, da, da, excuse me, Daniel, Talia, Claudia, mm-hmm. Isabella, and Santos. They were all living there, and it was kind of almost an extension yeah. of the college dorm room. They were having family dinners and, again, the very long discussions into the night. Um, they also were getting a lot of expensive gifts from Larry. They were getting clothes. They were getting expensive dinners. He would take them to these extravagant steak restaurants. He obviously very much liked the steak. <laughs> um And then he always had a wad of cash with him that he kept in a backpack that he yeah. took with him everywhere. And he had a limo on reserve that would take the kids anywhere yeah. at all time of the night, which again, especially if some of these kids maybe weren't coming from rich families, it's, it's nice like, to... oh, here's, you know, I'm yeah. being taken care of, like I'm getting food and he's making sure that I'm safe yeah. getting home at night. Because East 93rd Street, isn't that in Spanish uh, Harlem? It's kind of the beginning of Spanish Harlem. Yeah, the higher the beginning you go, of Spanish then it becomes, Harlem. Uh, you know, like, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm very close. Um, so, so he was claiming that the money was coming to him from being right. a life consultant to a wealthy friend. And then he started a domain name business, which made he made the kids help him with. And I believe his domain name business was he would buy domain yeah. names and park them and then charge people a lot of yeah. money <laughs> to um essentially buy well, that them was a very big thing at the time and, and it still is i guess you know yeah and yeah so this is like at this point what yeah. 2011 and unfortunately this is so this is where the confessions and shame and false yep. memories come in so he would have nightly yeah. meetings this is every night of core of this core work that he was supposedly teaching these kids to be their best selves uh but they he would put one of these kids in a hot seat in and front of the, them other, in front of the others it's like a the group night. session and f- it's a group session exactly and typically the person who would be put in the hot seat was somebody who did something mm-hmm. that larry didn't like because at this point larry had full-on control over things that the kids were doing inside of the apartment and blaming them for if somebody scratched a pan or broke a plate or if something happened to the knob or if there was something into the bathroom he would create these very long lists of everything that the kids had supposedly quote unquote messed up in the house with monetary values and saying, okay, now you owe me like $30,000 for breaking this and this and this. And at this point he had broken the kids down so much that they were like, I, I owe him $30,000. They were calling their parents to give them money. And the parents paid one of the parents uh, paid over $200,000 to Larry Four things supposedly Santos, broken in this apartment. The Santos $200, family uh, had a store. They sold the store uh, to get the money to give uh, to Ray. So, you know, Santos yeah. was uh, falsely is- accused, obviously. But then he he took full responsibility and just felt lousy. Felt he was doing his, uh, you know, his spiritual guide, coach along. But, you know, what's really crazy is you yeah. have instances where uh daniel now you're having girl issues and then it became isabella why don't you make love to daniel why don't you kiss him right now and it's happening in front of everyone in the group and that's supposed to help daniel uh you know then there was another time Mm -hmm. apparently where uh he forced daniel to wear a dress and one of the members was asked to forcibly have him use a sex toy so it's all this confusing, yeah. like he's yeah, already so- having issues. He broke up with this girlfriend. He's having issues with his sexuality. He's prey- They're all preyed upon, but now it's done in front of one another. Yeah. 
and the full on shame, which means then like now you're going to have the, yeah. you know, shame and judgment of your people. It also makes you um, feel so indebted to these people right now. They know you're like yeah. deepest, darkest secrets, like where are you going to go? Um, and they can tell people like, oh, my God, you know, he did this. Um, and there was actually one example that was in that uh, mm -hmm. cut article about and this is where the planting of the false memories come. So uh, Daniel was in the hot seat for doing something and he was um, supposedly he really liked playing the ukulele and it ended up after hours and hours of discussion that he played the ukulele because his father inflicted trauma on him. So Larry had him smash the instrument in front of the group as closure. And he said that he had immense pressure to find expla explanations for mm -hmm. any of his actions. And part of Larry's philosophy was that any small mistake that was created in this apartment, like again, yeah. the scratching of a plate, was a sign yeah. of childhood trauma. And this was around the time that he started blaming the kids for um, essentially trying to sabotage his program. Now hit the self-help program by essentially breaking things into the apartment. And then he also accused them of trying to harm yeah. his family. So and also while this is um, going on, there was he wants to do apartment repairs to an apartment that's not even his. And so he's having the kids yeah. do all this handyman work and, you know, spackling and building new shelving units. And that's yet another reason. That's yet Taking another, <laughs> uh, you know, path for him to take to blame them for stuff. You know, you, you did this improperly. Do you know how much damage you just did to this wall? And it's, it's that's the best yep, part is it's exactly. Lee Chen's apartment. It's just like, wow. That's and he's like, yeah, he's complete this dismantling and mantling, uh, dismantling it and then putting it back together the wrong way. And these kids, of course, have no construction right. know-how at all. And so they're doing construction during the day. They're having um, like their sleep taken away from them at night. They're also having to explore any subversive behavior that mm -hmm. Larry deems subversive. And they have to write it down in painstaking detail. And then they require written, signed confessions for this. So again, going back to that bite yeah. model, um, we're going through that. And uh, they Santos fully believed that he was interfering, interfering yeah. with Larry's business. And he this was around the time that he was getting his parents to give him all this money. Because then all of a sudden it became this like weird grievance thing that anything that these kids did was them essentially trying to hurt Larry and his family, which I guess included Thalia, which there is actually a pyramid of cults where mm -hmm. they have the leader is on the like tip top point and then the lieutenant is right next to them. And then it goes down to, you know, kind of the general uh, right. milieu, as it were. And even though this is a very small cult of five, six kids, you already have the um, mm -hmm. kind of levels, right? So you have Larry on top, you have Talia as his daughter. So now the other members, whenever they mess something up in the apartment, they are now going against Talia mm -hmm. and Larry. And then Isabella kind of goes up mm -hmm. to that level as yeah. well. Um, and Daniel and Santos, and then Santos brought his older sisters in mm -hmm. Yalitza and Felicia um, in the fall. And now mind you, as I was doing this research, Daniel and Claudia had actually gone away for the semester and he still managed to get to them yeah. by making them do Skype calls. So they were gone the whole semester and he kept them in the cult by essentially doing these sessions. He was also, I mean, let's, yeah. you know, bringing sex into this. So he had, Isabella and Daniel um, doing weekly sessions of sex yeah. while he watched, while he essentially directed them. So if you remember the bite model saying that take away the decision making mm -hmm. for very private That's matters. Right. So this is, a, you know, making the decision to take away from these kids yeah. like, okay, you're going to have sex and I'm going to tell you step by it's step really how you should have sex with each other. doctors came up with this bite model. Then, I mean, so far from the top, when you were describing it, everything is, is fitting into place. It's just, it's like clicks, also, clicks it, in. Um, there's a little background to Felicia. 
you know, the Santos sisters. She mm-hmm. at the time, it's important to know, was yeah. on her, she was doing residency. She wanted to become a doctor. Yeah. So um, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. And and she was, yeah, but we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them in a second. But so essentially, again, the exploitation of these kids, Larry yep. joined in having sex with Isabel and Danielle. And then he even had Shen, the owner of the condo, help. So apparently... Larry Chen got over his like, oh my God, what's happening? Because he was actually, I guess, having a foursome with Isabella, wow. Daniel, and wow. Larry at some point. And then um once Daniel and Claudia left, he Larry started making them mm-hmm. have sex together mm-hmm. on those Skype calls. So again, now he's uh controlling them and their yeah. personal decisions as well. So he was coaching them, which again, no to me where is they are, just... They could be anywhere. They could be abroad for the next semester. He's still going to be on top of them. Yeah. And he's still... And now, so so Santos um, and his family, this was uh, like, again, just heartbreaking because I also feel like this... Italian white dude uh, had totally took control of these um, uh, kids who were uh, yeah. from you know other countries. So Santos family came from the Dominican Republic to the Bronx in the early 1980s. Uh, his parents had emigrated there and they operated a small That's travel right. agency and a grocery they store in Washington Heights. And they had yeah, they had managed to save enough yeah. money to buy a home in the Bronx. And they managed, and again, this was amazing, managed to get their kids into like the yeah. best schools in the country. Yalitza was mm-hmm. an undergrad at Columbia when she first started uh, visiting that apartment on 93rd Street. And Felicia, who was the oldest, she yeah. was a Harvard graduate with a medical degree from Columbia. I mean, holy hell, like this is yeah. literally the American dream. And she was in her residency in Los Angeles when Larry started oh, calling her, her regularly. And he, he oh, and he managed to, yeah, and and he managed to get her to essentially, uh, she just abandoned her residency yep. program and moved in with him. And this is a girl who went to Harvard and Columbia Medical School. Like, I just, when I read that, I was like, what is happening here? Like, how did he do this? That's real power. I mean, to sway someone completely from their goals in life. Wow. Yes. And long distance. Because she was in Los Angeles and he was in New York. Like, that to me is like, what the fuck is happening here? This is why I went down the rabbit hole of finding out, like, how do you get indoctrinated into a cult? And so then it was like, okay, you can kind of, like, see see what it is. And, you know, the moment she she arrived in New York, they started having a romantic relationship and talked about marriage and having children together. And Larry both referred to both Felicia and Isabella as his wife. Now, again, these women are in their like, yeah. you know, early 20s. He's 50, yeah. uh, 55 at this point, fat, bald. I mean, you should see pictures of this guy, people. Like, this is not um, some handsome Svengali yeah. type. This is like a past middle aged, fat, so, yeah. like, I just, no. Um, it, it just really was shocking to me. But again, he, as we will go in next week, he had a very long history of manipulating women. I mean, this guy was such a master manipulator that the first time he um, went to jail, they had psychiatrists try to figure yeah. out what the hell he was. And one of the psychiatrists said that he lied so much. He's like, there is yeah. no way I can diagnose this yeah. guy. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Now, I did find an article after this latest um, uh, conviction uh, Mm -hmm. here in 2023 that he had been diagnosed with histrionic and uh, narcissistic personality disorder. And then, you know, this is obviously he's like a full on Mm -hmm. malignant narcissist. Um, But so everybody's now at this point living on East 93rd Street. So there's a bunch of people living in there. Now, Daniel kind of realized that um, around this time, 
this was very wrong. And he, after the whole dildo yeah. incident that you mentioned, he was so horrified and cried that he found the courage to leave. He um, acquired on-campus housing in 2013 in the spring semester, and he stopped responding to any phone calls yeah. from anybody who lived in that apartment. He um, got back together with his um, with his parents. Now, mind you, we haven't actually talked a lot about the violence that Larry uh, showed to these kids also as well. Also important to note is that so, he's filming uh, so much. From their confessions, uh, yes. from just from the violence, he films the violence. Uh, he's literally, I mean, yeah. it's all evidence to be this used all, later. I, that's what's. Which, again, it is yeah. all used as evidence in his trial. This is why he got 60 years in prison, because it was all documented. All, uh, it was all documented, all on video, and it actually helped some of these survivors get. Um, uh what is it decommissioned no uh when you come out of a oh, cult de you have to be uh de yeah. deprogrammed so it helped some of these survivors be deprogrammed yeah. because of these videos as well um but this Ooh. was actually uh, well i uh yeah so he said that he yeah. uh larry chen uh who was back in 2019 was interviewed by these reporters said that Larry would regularly mm -hmm. abuse mm -hmm. Santos and that he would put the 20 year old in sleeper That's holds right, until pardon. he passed That's out. Right. He would ask, yeah, that he would yep. ask, did the darkness envelop you when Santos woke up? And then once, uh, apparently Daniel supposedly damaged the oven. So Larry asked him to kneel and then stood over him with a knife yep. and threatened to dismember him. So yeah. Then you have the fear and uh, the retribution for all of these wrongdoings coming into these. And again, these are like 19 year old kids being completely yeah. manipulated. I can't. Daniel said I was fully prepared to be dismembered at this point. By like, I, I mean, literally thought this Daniel guy was going to kill me. Daniel through is just shocking. Um, and again, this is all on video, folks. Like uh, this, this, this. You know, the all this abuse is documented in one way or another. You know, there's. You literally see moving images of Larry Ray holding Daniel's tongue in a vice, like in a wrench, threatening to rip out his tongue. I mean, it's, uh, but then again, he has it on video, so he can hang it over the kids. I don't Horrible. know what it is. Like, I don't know what his intent is with all these videos. Well, it, it is, I mean, and that goes back to that control, yeah. which is the bite model. Like when I was, you know, doing research for this, I was like, I don't. Like, how are these kids so broken so quickly? This took like a year and a half. It's their age. Tops. It's their age. But because, because, well, it's their age, but it's also a very systematic mm -hmm. breaking down of self, which was very helpful when finding that bite model being like, oh, okay, so you're breaking down the thinking, you're isolating, you're yeah. then breaking down the emotions, then you're using fear to the point like, you know, I couldn't understand there was something in the article, they gave an example of these supposed damages mm -hmm. that were happened, right? That, um, so he would either claim that yeah. things were stolen from him or that there were ruined things of value and therefore they owed money. So Santos showed an email um, saying prices of things that I damaged ruined. And it was five pages accounting for more than 50 mm -hmm. items ranging from painting tape to a gas range. And the total was $47,000. And so again, this was Santos turned to his parents and said, I'm going to commit suicide if you do not pay this. Yeah. And so as parents, right, who have gone through so much are like, well, I don't want you to lose you. Um, of course, we'll pay. And you know, Santos's parents gave the money just because gave they were the money, so afraid. In case, we're still of unable Santos to speak with his them. own life. So they were getting a key from a Yeah. Yeah. You're but never hearing from your son. All of a sudden exactly, he's calling saying, exactly. I need the 47,000. He gets it. And then again, he can't, they can't speak with him. Yeah. And now, so this is not just happening to Santos, but this is also happening to Claudia, yeah. Yalitza, and Isabella as well. So they start asking their friends and family for money, saying that they damaged Larry's property. And there was this whole issue where um, Larry 
took uh took all of the kids to his stepfather's house in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and had them doing like yep. major yeah. construction on them uh, on the house. And there's videos say like the kids crying because they're he's making For them hours. like do plumbing in the middle For of hours. the night that they don't know how to do. Um, and then mind you, the parents, yeah, they can't get them out. These are all supposedly um adults. The um the Santos's parents went to the NYPD three times with the story, and the police told them there wasn't much that they could be done it's, because all of the kids right. were over the age of 18. Claudia's parents also alerted the police and they mm-hmm. did the same thing. Um in 2017, the police conducted a wellness check on Claudia and determined that she was acting from her own free will because right. again, these kids are on a cult and they're like this is all happening. It's true. I stole something like they're so brainwashed. They actually believe that they stole things from him and broke things. And now yeah. they owe and him then, so much money. You, I was just going to say, and then now, you think about the, the funny five, there was a five-year reunion of their class at Sarah Lawrence. So everyone obviously mm-hmm. except them, all the students, that's the topic of the entire reunion. Just everyone's talking about this. Like, what happened to them? They were so cool. They were so nice. I have, have you heard from them? I haven't heard from them. So imagine that you go to a five-year reunion, and it's just kind of like, yeah. wow, that was weird. But now it's weirder. Like, the fact that, like, he was here, now there none of them are here, you know? So I find that really interesting. Like, it yeah. really shook the town. It really shook the students. Yeah, it did. And now, of course, along with mind control comes yeah. like this dissonance in your mind. So uh, Yalitza's parents got a call in 2013 from Mount Sinai because she had tried to commit suicide by swallowing a bottle of Tylenol and was in a coma. But um, she was transferred to a hospital in White Plains and her parents were visiting her every day. And then one day, the security wouldn't let them into their daughter's room. And they said, I- yeah. we wanted to meet with Yalitza's doctor. Yeah. And they said, Larry's here. Larry's present. And Yalitza claimed that Larry was the one that examined her in a coma, looked at the lab results, and made suggestions to her medical mm-hmm. team, and he saved her life. So she was, again, not speaking to her parents, which these poor parents, I can't even imagine it's losing three children to this insane monster, not being able to go to the hospital, not being able to... and then having to sell their house that they worked so hard they on because everything. they were so afraid to lose their children. And he just, he, he just took, he took close to over yeah. $200,000 from them and that uh, NYPD couldn't do anything about it. Unfortunately, Claudia was also rushed to Mount Sinai in 2014. She also yep. swallowed a bottle of Tylenol and Claudia would only talk to Larry, not to them. And, um, now, according to family and friends, only Santos was the one who tried to right. like kill himself before Larry. But then after that, both Isabella, Yalitza, and Claudia had all attempted suicide. Um, and Larry later estimated that their cumulative number of attempts at more than twelve. So I don't know if that that met, like is yeah, he he's proud of stats. that? I mean, uh, the other, the other. I, I mean, it's just like it's a weird narcissistic power trip with like you know lying and all this stuff again he's studying he probably knows about the bite you know he he probably had a check checklist yeah he probably studied it now unfortunately um well on top of all of this other nightmare scenario uh it looked like claudia um her parents separated in 2013 a lot of it because of larry and um her mother eventually moved out of hotels. So Claudia started living in hotels, which by the way, at this point, Claudia was, uh, Larry had started essentially accusing Claudia of poisoning or trying to attempt to poison him and Talia. And she was so, yeah. And she, she, and released that video and she essentially admitted that she was trying to poison them. Um, She started, uh, working as an escort yeah. in 2014 under the nom de gore, which is a combination of Larry's daughter's names. And she essentially, um, she, yeah. her had, she had a website and she advertised services for $8,000 a night. And she would give yeah. all of her profits to Larry in order to pay for the damage she believed yeah. she'd done in North Carolina. And 
in the trial, it estimated that she probably gave him yeah, $1.5 million dollars from escorting, which, again, there is... Uh, I just hope he gets so destroyed in prison. I, I don't know. But again, with people who are such master manipulators, it's probably not going to happen because... You never know. I mean, you know, um, you know they may not be a, uh, under, you know, 15 years old, but nonetheless, you know, you, you still, there's still, uh, you're marked. These were kids. You know, at the end of the day, they're still underage. Yeah. And it, you know, yeah. Well, they're still underage well underage right. not by right. the government right. but in brain development um so finally uh isabella felicia and larry continued to live in the apartment on 93rd street santos and elisa came regularly but larry chen finally was like all, all right out. i am done with all of this yeah. and he evicted larry in 2014 and he claimed that he was becoming increasingly disturbed mm -hmm. by larry's treatment of the young adults in uh the apartment and also like what the yeah. fuck is going on with all of these renovations now uh larry of course countersued shen and he listed felicia isabella and talia as co-plaintiffs and the trial went um the case went to trial in early 2015 and claudia isabella and yalitza were witnesses and yeah. um uh, this is, again, where the false memories come in, because Larry's attorney asked Glenn, uh, uh, Larry's attorney, Glenn Rippa, asked Claudia yeah. how long she knew Larry. And this is where the insanity, again, this is God knows what the hell he planted in these kids' heads. So she, this is a quote from that cut article. Quote, the first time I heard his name mentioned was probably when I was nine years old. And which, mm -hmm. by the way, is completely not true. And over the course of her hour long testimony, she <laughs> laid out this elaborate conspiracy tracing back towards three generations of her family about uh, essentially trying to get Larry for his involvement with. Giuliani yeah. and Carrick, yeah. which again will go in next. Um, yes, yes, we're bringing in Giuliani into this. Uh, there's even, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there next week. Um, and that she had essentially, Claudia's mother had sent Claudia to Sarah Lawrence to quote, hurt mm -hmm. Larry and Talia. And so this is full on yeah. brainwashed memory implantation i mean it's and this is this is by the way in a court of law under oath um yeah, yeah. so she unfortunately as, I mean, like, so just as a, I, a little background as to how crazy just a little he said he always claimed uh that he was related to al capone okay so that's pretty bonkers uh, mm -hmm. He was actually born 1959, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. His birth name was Greco, and he later changed it to his stepdad's last mm -hmm. name. Uh, and, you know, his folks divorced. And so, you know, what's funny is, like, sometimes I'm thinking he, he's also taking his trauma emotions and his trauma and probably displacing a lot of that, you know. He probably had issues with his stepdad or with his dad. Who knows? I mean, maybe I'm reaching... But basically, everyone across the board said uh, Larry Ray could be whoever you wanted him to be. That's how manipulative and how much of a chameleon he was, yeah. that he knew how to act with Giuliani. Then he knew how to act with someone like Daniel. I mean, it just goes back and forth. You don't even know who he is. Back and forth. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. So um, he, uh, Ch Larry Chen won the eviction, but it so took him long. another yeah. year to get him out of the apartment. And I think it's so long. So I think we, we didn't go over everything horrifying thing that happened to these children, but as you can get a we'll pretty get good it. sample, I mean, this was, uh, wow. a, a manipulative, abusive, violent, uh, sexual yeah. cult of seven people. And next week, we will uh, talk about who Larry is, his insane wow. stories. With He actually crossed yeah. paths with a lot of very famous people because he was this chameleon. And we'll get into whatever, what, what happened in the trial. So hopefully this will be two episodes. Maybe it'll be three if we need to do a third episode on the trial. But I hopefully feel like we'll Johnny do it Ray in has like next dashes of Epstein. 
in him. Larry Ray, I'm sorry. You mean Larry uh, Ray? Has has little dashes yeah. of that Jeffrey Epstein, I have this over you, I have ultimate power, I can get these girls to prostitute and do anything. There's like, there's something along, yep. I don't know, and, and I just can't explain it. And I also do think in a way, it is creepier that, to, that it's not your typical huge cult that it's a small organized group I find a, a yeah. little more intimidating and, and creeped out by. Right. And, and how easily, you know, you could, again, yeah. in a very vulnerable time in your life, fall into something like this. And God forbid you fall across a path yeah. of one of these kinds of people, because, I mean, it took years for some of these kids to get deprogrammed. And some of them are still, yeah. obviously, Isabella never got deprogrammed. Thank She's going to the jail. Santos kids all got um, back together and and with their family. So that's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, look at the have, I mean, they didn't die, but look at the havoc that happened yeah, to really their, are. you know, to them and to their parents for years, and for the rest of their lives. For like, years, you know? Yeah. It's just, it's the mind control yeah. stuff scares the crap out of me because our brains are so malleable to be able to essentially uh, put a program into your head. So like brainwash you mm -hmm. and then stick in yeah. false memories and to essentially believe that three generations of your family yeah. was after yeah. this one guy, Larry Ray, and like how your brain kind of twisted that story around into truth that you would actually go into a court of law under you know, yeah. the uh, threats of perjury to like tell this insane non-reality story. It's just, to me, it's is, brain is, is, I mean, is you're basically chilling. Hacking. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's brain hacking. Yeah, somebody's brain, which is, again, the bite model, um, which yeah. was a very fascinating reading. Explains because, again, lot. the Russians... <laughs> What I, what I, what I'm much interested also perhaps on the next, um, uh, next time, uh, we do this is to, to go and I'm curious to know, was this premeditated? Did he know that there was opportunity to do this in living with them? Uh, you know, you know, Talia, you know, hopefully maybe it was Talia who gave him the idea to move in. Maybe he did it. Like, I, yeah. I'm just curious to know if he thought about this before it actually happened. Well, because I'm wondering right, if this is right. just the way he goes through life. <laughs> like, he's like, oh, I need a place to live. I'm going to go live in this uh, in this dorm room. And, oh, here's like an 18-year-old that I want to have yeah. sex with. All right. How am I going to get her to have sex with me? All right. I can totally take advantage of her. Oh, and here's this other <sighs> person. And there is um, – when I was doing uh, research on him, there is a thing about him, again, like um, – being attracted hmm. to powerful people and felicia was a powerful i mean she's like a harvard grad going to be a doctor from columbia like this is a yeah. powerful intellectual young woman and like i for him who is so deviant and gross being like hmm, yeah how can i destroy that can i destroy that can i figure out how to like get under her skin and yeah. like this look almost like a challenge it's right so um, yeah guys, i mean we can know? we can yeah so we can uh, we can definitely discuss that next cool. week because we're going to go all through yeah. uh, who exactly this guy was with all of his crazy ass stories and uh, gloat and be happy with the fact that he got 60 yeah. years. He's never coming out of jail and hopefully bad things are done to him. Um, uh, <laughs> not please, wishing please, anything on wishes. anyone, but oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like oh god yeah anyway so thank you for joining us um happy saint patrick's day and um tune in to us next time when we do part two of uh freak show larry ray <laughs> all right have a good day everybody
This episode was sponsored by The Creek Killer, book one in the Harriet Harper thriller series written by me, Dominica Best. What would you do if you read The Police Found Your Body in a Creek? Find out in The Creek Killer, available on Amazon. Thank you for joining me and listening to this episode. If you like my show, please give me a rating and review. It helps other listeners find this podcast. Follow Dominica Best Presents The Deviant Mind wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit thebeststorytellingnetwork.com where you'll find show notes, my books, links to social media, and much more. Join my Patreon for special subscriber perks, like two extra exclusive episodes a month and a Q&A with me at patreon.com forward slash the deviant mind podcast. Until next time. <laughs>